Thanks so much, Travis. It's, uh, it's nice to be back. It's nice to follow Jen, because uh, talking about some of the opportunities for school maker spaces and other things are very related to the work that we're doing in Pittsburgh. So my name is Matt Hannigan. I'm from an organization in Pittsburgh called the Sprout Fund. And we've been catalyzing innovation in our community through a combination of small grant support, community building, and other kinds of activities for the last 13 years. Uh, through that support, we've offered um, projects uh, totally more than 550 endeavors, more than $4 million, uh, really investing in the people and ideas that are changing our community. Um, and several years ago, we became the steward of a learning network in Pittsburgh that I'll talk a little bit more about. So I'm sure that many of us have had the opportunity to, to make something at a, a tech shop-like space or another kind of like hack space. Like all the class public level years, people done making in those kinds of spaces, yeah? Okay, well, what about homemaker spaces? Anybody with a workshop at home? All right, got a couple of those. How many of you had maker spaces in your schools when you were growing up? In the, in the middle school or the other kinds of places? What would have the opportunities been for your learning if you had actually been able to take those kinds of maker learning practices and put them to work in the high school or middle school where you attended? Well, in Pittsburgh, maker spaces in schools are actually just one of the ways in which we're helping to remake learning uh, by bringing innovation that typically happens in out of a school also into the classrooms. So let's take a look. It's nice sound. It's not the teacher giving them information and having it's not the teacher back giving them now information okay. and having the space to fit it back. Teachers. Uh, so maybe we'll come back to, to the video, but, but this is a, a, a example of some of the work that's happening in the Elizabeth Ford School District, which is in a rural part of the metropolitan county that surrounds the Pittsburgh area. It's actually sort of right on the edge of suburban, urban, rural, and it's not an affluent district. These aren't multi-million dollar homes creating a great tax base. Uh, this is a community that struggled with the, all kinds of the issues that many people uh, support. And so now we're gonna take a look and see what they've been up to. And the future is here, the future is now for our kids. My design. Folks from Grave and Brick Bear have talked to companies of all across the country. A lot of schools they are sort looking at that, just that little push to say, hey, Elizabeth Ford, go, go to the outer reaches of, of your ideas and, and dreams. Um, I can share a, 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 the link with, with you for the video, but the, the short of the long is that they've actually broken down, so maybe I'll just tell you what they've done in Elizabeth Forward. So they've actually broken down the walls between three classrooms, the art studio, the computer lab, and the sort of the old tech shop at the school and created what they call the dream factory. And so these three teachers are now actually working collaboratively to build out education and curriculum that actually goes seamlessly between those uh, environments. And Elizabeth Forward has gone even farther than that because this is actually just the most recent example, the kinds of physical transformation. Um, when we first met the superintendent of the school district, he talked about actually wanting to take his school from frontier land to future land. And through the different efforts that they've engaged over the last several years, that's certainly part of what's happened there. They uh, created the first small lab, a situated media arts laboratory in the first public school in the country. Uh, they, broke, they changed their library into a U-media-like production-focused space. They turned a stodgy old classroom actually into a game design laboratory. And all of these other kinds of innovations that are actually having a tremendous impact. And when you talk to the students from Elizabeth Forward, they actually they feel engaged with the school day in a way that was never possible before. And so they're one of the shining examples that's happening here. And, and many of the innovations that they've pioneered, they're now getting attention from their peers both in Pennsylvania as well as nationally because the results are pretty striking. Uh, test scores have improved. Reading and math proficiencies are up 5%. Their dropouts have gone from uh, 24 in 2009 to only one during the last academic year. Uh, and they've risen among their peers in Pennsylvania more generally. So it's, it's pretty impressive, uh, the work that they've been able to do there. And in terms of what makes a transformation like this possible, we think it really takes a network and a whole community approach to that kind of learning innovation. 
And so in Pittsburgh, we've helped create a, a network that helps support maker learning and other kinds of learning innovation through a combination of different activities, bringing together people from across sectors. And we have this rich DIY community. We heard this morning when Peter was talking about Pittsburgh's industrial legacy as a maker city. And we still have that very much today, but we also have some really great opportunities to put the tinkerers and artists and others sort of into these classroom environments and build them out in ways that help children combine both the physical and the digital skills uh, that really create powerful learning experiences, bridging gaps between science and engineering, technology and media, crafts and the arts, and all about discovering their passions and, and reshaping their world. So for us, this potential opportunity for maker learning to positively improve educational outcome, outcomes has been a substantial source of investment locally by our philanthropic community in terms of advancing this work going forward. And we've built a network that we call Kids and Creativity that's helped make this possible. So our network includes the active participation of four distinct sectors, and these are more than 2,000 innovators working across 200 organizations classified in these uh, four areas. So we've got formal and informal learning environments, learning research and advocacy, innovation research and development, entrepreneurial support and commercial interests, and then finally strategic stewardship to bring it together. So to talk a little bit about and illustrate the ways in which these sectors come together, I wanted to share with you uh, some discussions about the Make Shop in Pittsburgh. So Make Shop is the signature making learning environment that's happening, we'll come back to the slide, don't worry, uh, uh, that's happening in our Children's Museum. And they're really bringing together the digital and the physical in this, in this tremendous way. They mix old and new technologies together to create immersive learning experiences that combine the cutting edge media that's available today with tried and true practices. So the facilitators in the make shop are actually, in many instances, former hackers themselves or people who like to take these kinds of things apart. And they're actually now situated in this museum context so that kids can toy around with all kinds of new materials from conductive thread and wood uh, all the way out to actually printmaking and animation in that same sort of way. So let's return to the ecosystem model that I showed earlier about the Kids and Creativity Network and talk a little about uh, how the Make Shop is a great example of these sectors coming together uh, to create this incredible learning experience. So the Children's Museum is obviously a signature informal learning environment in our community as, as well. But the innovations that they're creating through the mobile Make Shop instructional kit uh, and the work directly with classroom teachers means that that kind of learning has the opportunity to migrate into other schools that are in our community. In some instances, actually just migrating across the street to the school that's directly across the way that has 98% free and reduced lunch, being able to bring maker practices into the elementary education that's happening there. In terms of innovation, research, and development, MakeShop wouldn't be possible without the students and professors from Carnegie Mellon University's Entertainment Technology Center working at the design phase of this initiative. So ETC is the world's actually premier graduate program for budding game designers and other interactive media uh, professionals. And they contributed deeply to the development of MakeShop and its approach. They're also the ones that were the design folks behind U Media in Chicago at the outset. In terms of learning research and advocacy, MakeShop also engaged the University of Pittsburgh's Center for Learning out of school environments to help bring a real research-based approach to the work that's happening there. And I think it demonstrates the Children's Museum's commitment to actually building a research-based understanding of the ways in which maker learning has the opportunity to improve learning outcomes for children and youth. And then finally, MakeShop has actually act acted as an incubator space itself. It served as a platform for a local project called Dreamflight Adventures to actually do the play testing on their interactive education simulator before it was installed in a local school district. And so this is someone who had a vision of creating the Starship Enterprise inside a school to provide make-based missions for people to actually execute. And a lot of the programming and activities were actually play tested at the make shop before uh, that project launched. So as the strategic steward, sort of sitting in the center of all these things, our job is to marshal all of the resources of the Pittsburgh Kids and Creativity Network to accelerate learning and achievement for children and youth. And really putting out into the community a situation of if the whole city is thinking about learning and the ways in which we can sort of empower that going forward, what are the potential opportunities? 
Pittsburgh, as you may know, has a legacy of, of innovation, both at the industrial level, but also as it relates to learning. Uh, Pittsburgh is the home of Fred Rogers, himself quite an innovative maker in his day, and he leveraged the new technology in the 1960s, public television, to actually change the face of learning for children and youth. That's the kind of thing that our modern day Fred Rogers are doing as well. And that's combined with the work that's happening at places like Carnegie Mellon, which has had disruptive innovations in multiple industries from robotics to gaming to arts and science and other kinds of things so that the companies that are built out of Carnegie Mellon spin-outs have a greater opportunity to stay put in Pittsburgh and have their innovations benefit the children and youth that are there. What does the Sprout Fund do to support this network and, and how do we assure that this network continues to generate these kinds of great experiences? Well, working closely with our local and national funding partners, we've established several roles for us as an organization to be that strategic steward. So as a convener, we help to build the field through knowledge sharing activities and other events as a communicator, we amplify the voice of our region's innovators, helping to provide a platform for them to talk about their work in a way that wouldn't be possible if we counted on them to do it on their own. And then as a catalyst, similar to the role that Sprout has had historically, we act as a direct funding support for new projects and activities that are happening locally, providing support of up to $15,000 to three to four projects every other month in two classes of funding, one that's focused on early learning and another that's focused on learning for teens, tweens, and young adults. So jumping to the field building activities, these include meetings, workshops, other professional development initiatives, hopefully creating opportunities for people to come together both within their own discipline, but also across disciplines to share knowledge. It also enables people to attend important events and activities to share to the broader community uh, the work that's happening in Pittsburgh through presentations at symposiums and conferences, or to import knowledge that they learn from those kinds of activities into our learning ecosystem. For example, we've helped to support the Andy Warhol Museum to go to MozFest in London, that's the Mozilla Festival, uh, where they presented at the maker party that was happening there, the Warhol time capsule, a very Warholian project, but actually it was based on what you had in your pockets. So they got kids and others to take all the things out of their pockets, put them on a 3D scanner, and see what you would you know, capture as a little time capsule of yourself just based on what you had. Um, and so that kind of support wouldn't be possible without Sprout there to provide that kind of stipend in order to people to travel. In terms of storytelling and communications, we're really trying to provide a platform for people to talk about the work that they're doing separate from actually doing the work themselves. We found historically over the years that the people who are leading our initiatives are often so busy actually doing the projects that they don't have time to stop and reflect. So we hire professional documentarians writers, photographers, videographers to help produce the kinds of communications pieces or the kinds of photos that we're seeing here that actually tell the story not only of the project outcomes, but actually also about the way in which the project is using innovative approaches for maker learning going forward. And then more than just an active web presence, we also create uh, different kinds of uh, communications vehicles through our blog called Remake Learning which hopefully it helps to create opportunities for people to share and interview and talk about the different kinds of things that they're working on uh, as a way to communicate that knowledge broadly. And then lastly, in terms of catalytic grant making, we provide grants to organizations like Assemble, which is part venue, part gallery, part workshop. It's a place where makers young and old come together to share, learn, and be with one another. They host drop-in learning parties that connect local experts with aspiring young novices to create great opportunities to learn in a very comfortable social space in a neighborhood that's in transition in our community. Another good example of catalytic support that's happening in a county that's next to the one that surrounds Pittsburgh is coming from a career in tech school. And this is an outdoor clean energy learning laboratory where the students are actually involved both in the design phase as well as in the eventual construction and production of a full size uh, electric power generating windmill and a space uh, for people to actually learn near the windmill, so it's like a learning laboratory there as well. So the students have the opportunity to participate in the design phase, the green job construction work, and then once it's built, this will actually be a venue that's available to the whole school district going forward. So we're trying to build a model in Pittsburgh that's authentic to our local context and harnessing 
the best that we have available in all of these different ways. But we're also cognizant of the need and opportunity to connect with global networks that are doing similar kinds of efforts. And so we're very proud to be one of the Hive learning networks uh, in North America. Jen was talking about her relationship to Hive in Toronto. They're one of the other ones alongside of New York and Chicago and many other places that are coming on. And, and Hives really uh, take the practice of connected learning and, and put it into action. And I'll talk a little bit about that. Hives is an initiative that's deeply supported by the MacArthur Foundation's Digital Media and Learning Initiative. Uh, and it really helps to create a situation where what if there are no boundaries between in-school, out-of-school, online learning? What kind of learning is enabled in that sort of way? It advances the principles of connected learning, which is a research-based framework developed by folks like Mimi Ito and Nicole Pinkard that suggests that in a world where learning can happen anywhere, anytime, the most powerful learning is one that actually bridges the three spheres of influence that are most important to young people, the peer culture and social networks, academic achievement, and interest-based learning. So Hive networks are both locally hyper-connected in terms of being networks, but they're also globally connected through the stewardship of the Mozilla Foundation, the folks behind the Firefox web browser, who are trying to help create the next generation of makers and web makers in their local communities. So although each Hive city is different, we actually have the opportunity to work with one another and to share strategies going forward. So when we think about what's been happening in Pittsburgh over the last several years, we recognize that we've had a sort of an informal and organic movement that's really taken root in our community. We've now got the, op the support of many of the stakeholders at the academic, civic, cultural, and community level working together in this shared role. Sprout was selected as a steward because we can be a trusted intermediary working between the different network members. Because networks are complicated. They got many moving parts, organizations with diverse interests, sometimes competing interests, and different missions. So what we enable our folks to do is to actually work collaboratively and connectively, but also still stay focused on what's true and important to them. So we've been able to empower both educators and uh, learners to access and achieve greater outcomes through learning that's maker-focused and bringing in other kinds of innovative practices. As we sort of look to the future of what's happening here in Pittsburgh, we're tremendously excited to share the work that we've begun and to learn from other cities as we step forward into the next generation of this kind of work and activity. So thank you to Maker Media for inviting us to participate, and uh, please come see us in Pittsburgh. Thanks.